I had come across this community a number of times in my in my academic work and I felt a connection to this community because of my own experience as an adoptee of the 60s scoop. I've sat down with these people and I've talked to them and I've heard their stories and you know I can't believe what people in our community have lived through. We probably will have done over 30 interviews by the time we're done for this project and I found out that I really didn't know a lot about this community or its history. It's been quite a learning experience. Yeah, I've definitely learned a lot more about the, this community and a lot more about uh, an Aboriginal history that a lot of people in Canada don't even know happened. The number of people that have shared their experiences, it's like getting multiple sort of lenses on, on this issue from all different all different perspectives of what happened and just how it devastated the community and and how people are so many people are still struggling to deal with their own emotional trauma from it and this is the community's project it's the community's information it's going to be the community's collective memory in this video and in so many ways I'm just kind of following the process I think it's a very important thing to talk about just so that people will have a better understanding in order to heal, one of the most important things is to remember and tell your story in the presence of witnesses. And um, I think that's what this is about. It's about remembering and telling the truth about terrible events. Yeah, there's a truth to be told here. There's a story in my heart. My Indian name is Chwum, and I'm told that the meaning of that name is that there's a berry that we call schusa, or soap berry, but when you whip it up and it reaches just the right stage, you say it's Chwum. So that's my name. My grandfather said one day, you want to come, come to the mountains? We'll go find some huckleberries. We had one horse. I walked up. I let my sister ride the horse all the way up to the mountain. We'd see grizzlies, black bears, deer. I'm picking huckleberries on the way. Uh, any kind of berries we see, sometimes we mix it. Spend uh, three days in the mountain. It was a good life with my mum and dad and my grandmother. I think all them people a long time ago, they worked hard. My mom taught us a lot how to preserve foods, uh, drying berries, smoking salmon, drying deer meat, and all that without refrigeration and electricity. Me and the wife, we still practice that. Everybody was friends, you know. We used to go to church here, the whole community, and meet and talk, you know. My grandmother used to have a big cookhouse in the summer, in the fall. She'd feed all the people, she'd invite them all the way from Chase, no matter where it was. He'd all go over to her house and she'd feed them all. And Grandpa and Granny had that new house built next to the log house. People used to come to listen to stories. They're what we call legends or jiptaklas in our language and come and listen and she'd have tea and jam and snacks on and pies. Her pies were the best. They were really just melt in your mouth pies. So a traditional adoption, you were raised by your 
Your Se auntie? My second cousin, my mom's second cousin. Um, yeah, my grandmother's cousin from a different family. He lived off reserve. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how, how old were you when, when that happened? Been at birth. In the Spati culture, traditionally, a long time ago, grandparents used to raise the children while the parents were away working. My son, Aaron, was the firstborn grandson, and my mother raised him. A lot of people have trouble, you know, when they're young parents, and I was lucky enough to have my mom there. And she's raised Aaron with all of our traditions, our protocols, our customs. She really influenced, I guess, my morals and right from wrong and how to be a better person, I guess. Just because she's, I don't know, she was a bit older, a bit more grounded, I guess. Yeah, a bit wiser. She's a kia, you know, not eligible. She is the matriarch of our family. Yeah. You know, she is the holder of the culture and the language and the family values, you know, and, um, you know, it, it was her rightful place to, to raise you. It's a language that is uh, really a powerful language when you learn it. And I myself, I'm just starting to learn it, and I'm actually a grandfather. I'm a grandfather of uh, 18. And I've had to commit myself to learning the language to teach my grandchildren because it's something that was not taught to me in the home when I grew up when I was brought up in foster care for part of my life. The main street just walked in. And then they had the RCMP on their side. I was 12 years old when I was removed from our family. You know, it was uh, just that whole experience, I think it uh, was going on for a lot of us at that time, the 60s school. Kind of. The social worker, the infamous Miss Oram, she came to the house and with the intention to apprehend us. And my mother stopped her and told her to get out, you know, and that she had no business apprehending her kids because I look after my kids, you know, you know, just, you know, and my mom threw her off the property. And then she came back and she had the RCMP with her. In the meantime, my mom had told us to go in the house and lock the door and no matter what happened, don't open the door. And then uh, she took her 22 single shot rifle and sat on the front step. And my mom, by this time, she was really riled up. And the constable, he said to my mom that, you know, he understood there was trouble and that the social worker was just there to do her job, you know. And my mom said to the, to the RCMP, you know, you know me, you know, you've seen me around this community, you know damn well, you know, that I look after my children you know, and nobody's taken my kids, you know. It, the only way that you're going to take my kids is if you put a bill, bullet through me first, you know. And, and she said, and I'm serious, you know. And, and you, and she pointed at that social worker, you know, look at your, your, look at your breasts, your, you got tits enough there to go make your own kids while you want to come around here and steal my kids for. You know, you'll be the one who gets the bullet first. She told her that, you know. You can shoot me after, but you'll have a bullet too, you know. So, so that constable was saying, you know, Tessie, you know, settle down, you know. He said, you know, I agree, you know, I can speak to that. You know, I've seen you look after your kids, you know. I didn't really realize how many people were impacted until I came back. My mom was uh, sitting on the bed with my youngest sister. She was only two months mm -hmm. old at the time. And I, 
just asked her what happened. She said they came and got all the kids. I said, why? And she said, well, I don't know. And I think, I, I really don't know. I, you know. I'd have to look at it and think about it, but I don't really know. But maybe because she was a single parent, I don't know. I really don't know. And maybe she couldn't stand up for herself. And I have no idea. I really don't know, quite honestly. Mom was away working when they took them. And she was trying to raise, you know, get some money for groceries and stuff. Yeah. And Shirley and I tried to keep the house clean and feed their brothers. And um, we managed for several months until one day the ministry caught us and Faces looking at me. When a child is born, if it's a girl, you're the mother's helper. If a child is born, it's a boy, you're your dad's helper. You're the hunter. You're the fisherman. You're the worker. You can help feed the family. That sort of the old ways. But it almost seemed that they were appalled at the conditions that existed on the reserve. Um, so this would be now like early 50s, right? Because um, I wasn't very old. And it seemed like the, wor the word that was going around the community, I think when you heard people talking about, about it, it was, well, they took their kids away just because their house is not big enough. You know, they don't have enough rooms or they don't have enough this or they don't have enough that for their kids you know and there was others you know they were they had had their kids apprehended because they were drinking because alcohol hit our community and hit hard i was born in 54 so uh I have memories of our community and uh, the alcoholism that was going on, the, the rampant uh, violence, um, walking this road here, the canyon road, and having people from town all the way up pass out alongside the road. So as, as a child, right, that's the kind of memory that I have. As well-intentioned as our parents were, um, they really didn't have any control once they were, once they were, once they were drunk. You know, they couldn't protect themselves and they couldn't protect us. And my mom, it just made her worse. She just said, what's the use now? My kids are gone. They won't give them back to me. I might as well just drink. And she, what she said was drink myself to death. I went, no, there's, I'm still here. You know, we'll, we'll find a way. But we never did get them back, and they came back on their own. And uh, quite angry with Mom, actually, because of what they thought she did, but it wasn't her fault. In the 60s, it was hopeless. They know darn well they'll never get their kids back. You know, I think nobody told them what at least she could try, but knowing that what they were up against is the provincial government. I don't think most of our people really understood what was going on. You know, they didn't know how to get through the system to have access to their children, to have their children return to them. And I remember standing in front of that magistrate telling me, that I abandoned my daughter, which I didn't, but I couldn't prove it. And you weren't allowed to speak up. The magistrate, magistrate said, 
I'll let you know when you can speak up. I couldn't defend myself. And he told me that I would never get her back. And true to their words, I never got her back. They just gave up, a lot of them just gave up. Believing that their kids are better off, some of them, you know. It's a world we can't, you know, it's a world we are having a difficult time functioning in, you know. We can't provide for our kids. You know, we can't dress them the same as, as, as the, the kids in the, in the schools are dressed. We can't hardly understand their language when people are, what they're talking about. Yep. You know, the kids might be better off. Let somebody else raise them up and give them the, give them the good way, give them the education. Why? I don't think I'm any different than the next person. I love to laugh, I love to talk, I love to play. I says, but what happened? I said, I had no childhood. And then I get told, I'm just a piece of trash. I was raised in Cranbrook at the uh, Indian school or residential school. I lost my mom when we were just young. My dad turned to, to alcohol and he couldn't look after us. So that's why we were sent to the residential school. There was about seven of us and uh, I remember my dad leaving and we were crying and screaming because nobody explained anything to us and it was really hard being lonely not having anybody to hold you or to say they loved you well i was about 20 21 before i left from there i thought it was going to be a, a good experience because my father taught us our ABCs. And then when the engine agent and the police and the chief came, I don't know why there was a need for them to come. You know, it was going to be a good experience. So they told my father that if he didn't let us go that they were going to put him in jail. So we were taken away to Cranbrook from here. And our people had great reverence for formal education. And that was why the language shift happened too, was parents saying to their children, you have to learn to speak English to get by. So by Christmas, we were reading a few words at a time. And what I saw in the newspaper was my, my parents' name, Lucy, Daniel, and our names. And I would, I would take them and I would group them together. And I would carry them around with me. I think thinking that if, if I did that, Somehow, at least their names were with us. So different than anything that I knew at home, you know, because at home we were, we were free, yeah. and now we're not free, you know? And there's all these rules, there's all these things that you have to do. There's, I mean, we, we were issued a number, you know, my number was 172. The only reason the residential schools came to be was to remove us from the land. That's what it was all about, because if they take the Indianness out of us who we are, then they're able to access the resources, they're able to take the land, and that's what they did. You know, it's cultural genocide at its best. 
I didn't have those precious times where I could really say, well, you know, I had a chance to listen to the legends or the stories or or anything that had to do with our culture and our language. And so we grew ashamed of our language. And I, and we were always called heathens too. That if we didn't act like the way the, the normal white society would act, we were, we would be called a heathen. When I'm, I was growing up, it was hard for me to figure out who I really was. Um, because of being taken away from my parents, my brothers and sisters, to go into foster homes and not knowing the people. And then from foster homes to residential schools. And I guess I can say I was one out of so many that got so badly brainwashed. My father passed away when I was four and my mother brought us up until, well, till maybe around I was seven and drinking became a big thing in her life and uh, to have the Mormon people come in and remove, well, <clears throat> I shouldn't say remove, but, um, but re put us into foster homes, into foster care. Uh, I, th I look back at it now and I think that it was a great thing for, to happen to us. I think I was 13 and I felt, uh, I thought that my life had ended and uh, it was interesting because I actually contemplated taking my life, you know, I never talk about that but that's what I contemplated because it was like, you know, it's like I was, what could I do? I just, you know, I felt powerless and uh, helpless. Yeah, I went to a couple homes actually, like three homes. But it was uh, all non-First Nations homes. I think the last one was probably the best one, but they, because they treated me as a human being, not as a, <laughs> not as an Indian. I think that's probably the best way I can describe it. And I owe a lot to them actually because they stood by me. Because I got into a lot of trouble. I ended up in jail. Um, you know, I did crazy things when I was young, and uh, and they uh, they never gave up on me. And I think it's because of them that I actually uh, got, I guess, if you will, some com some confidence or some uh, the ability to do something because actually somebody believed in me. They locked me in the basement. I was so afraid of the dark. I got moved again to another home, and um, I was there maybe a day. And um, I think they wanted someone a bit older. Um, just to do some extra stuff or whatever. Then I ended up going back into an orphanage. I remember this one time, and to this day, I think it's the happiest moment of my life. Um, my mom came there, and um, I might have been five, and she brought this doll. I mean, you know, it was just a little plastic doll, and. Um, and I treasured it. And she wasn't there for very long, um, but just seeing her, um, I just, I was just crying because I just missed her so much. And as I got older in a home, I asked um, if I had any other, you know, living relatives and whatnot, and I was told no. So I thought, okay. The, the worker had come back to the school, you know, a, a couple of months later. And she said that you have two brothers that live across on the south side. I lived on the north side of town and they lived on the south side. And I was just so excited, right? I was just like, wow, I, I knew it, I knew it. I uh, walked in there and, and saw him and I was like, oh my God, right? And right away, you know, they said, this is your brother. And, and I went up to him and gave him such a big hug. It was just like... I was in tears, right? And I, because I just couldn't believe it. And I says, oh my God, like finally, right? We kept in touch um, with my, uh, my brother and I didn't know anything about my sisters at that time.
I didn't feel I belonged here. I didn't belong, you know, um, in the city. It was kind of like, what do I do? Like, who am I? Growing up in a foster home, uh, it's like we didn't really know who we were. You know, all we knew is that we were from Enderby and we didn't really know anything about uh, some of the cultural stuff that goes on with our people. Uh, I think, it's, I'm not sure if we got lost in there for a while. So then I think it wasn't until the early 70s, now those children were now becoming young adults and wanting to come home. When you send kids back to the reserve after being off the reserve for so many years, complete strangers, some will accept them back, some won't. Possibly in their mind, they had a picture of what home was like, you know? And, you know, possibly built up kind of this dream or this good place, you know, that this was the good place, you know. And then when they came home, the reality of what they came, what was home, was was very disturbing for some of them. Or they, you know, you know, it wasn't what they wanted to to, to it to be. There was like groups or gangs. They 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 weren't they weren't gangs like people think of gangs. Their families like hordes of families that just truck together and all of a sudden boom they're at your house and they're partying in your house and uh, kind of things. There was elders getting their doors kicked in and there's food stolen. There was some um, elders getting sexually abused. There was like it was a not a very healthy place. I think it changed when Wayne got in as chief. You know we went through this whole period um, where alcohol was actually banned from our reserve and signs were posted everywhere, there's no drinking. Like the community just started rolling. Um, we built your higher school. Like we started looking at, like here we are, what are we gonna do, where we wanna be in the future? And people are actually making plans in that and uh, working towards them. When things started to turn around was in 75. Uh, the bands got together and they closed down the, reach, the district office in Vernon, the Indian Affairs. The younger people started to take the leadership positions and started to say, okay, we can't keep living like this. You know, we have to do, we have to do something differently, you know, and beginning to recognize, you know, how terrible, um, you know, Indian Affairs was, you know, and the bureaucracies, you know, how, how awful they were, you know, and, that, and how out of control, you know, our community was and how much control they had over us and our, and our you know, our day-to-day -day lives. Native people are demanding more control over their future and what happens to their children. This protest rally organized by the Spalamjean Indian Band marked the beginning of a concerted drive to change government policy. Since 1951, 100 children have been taken from the Spalamcheen Indian Band. 100 children from a band with a population today of only 300. Wayne was one of those children who were apprehended. He wanted to see that we have our own, protect our own children. No more ministry. No more coming in and taking children away. No more leaving be parents behind where they become alcoholics with no help whatsoever. No support. Wayne really fought for that child welfare program for our community. Him and the elders and some of the leaders from the shoe shop. Keep us safe, keep us free like it.
it's difficult not to be sympathetic with Indian bands in British Columbia who feel that their children have been, quote, stolen, quote, kidnapped from them by the white man's social welfare and court system. 2880 in the province of BC. Oftentimes, um, this community is referenced as one of the ones that the, was the hardest hit. You know, kids being scooped from this community and by the busload and, and the workers just coming and taking kids for virtually no reason. We do not uh, rush in and apprehend children uh, unless there is a cause. And what, causes, what causes would there be child with abuse. Indians different from wild, mm -hmm. white children? Child abuse, uh, child neglect. And um, we are, the federal government does all social services on, on the, uh, uh, within the bands. You know, our own indigenous families were seen as in poverty and had nothing in the homes. You know, they said there's no food and not recognized that maybe there's dried meat and other things that was in the homes. So I think there was a bias going on. And Do you suggest that there is in fact, and I don't want to bully you, it, it, that there has been any kind of deliberate cultural genocide way, or is it just a... Well, if you analyze it and look at it, quite honestly, like in our community, we're just a little over 300 strong, and we have had 100 children taken from our community, and that's 30% of our population. For how, over how long? Okay, from 1951 to 1961, we had 70 children taken, or one generation, and we're suffering because of that now. In the 50s, the percentage of Indian children in care in this province was like 2%. As soon as they signed an agreement, it went up to 30%. So it, uh, and today it's like 50 and 60 percent. It's just unbelievable. And it's the same thing is going on. The feds pay the province and, you know, it's still, uh, I still think it's economically driven, I believe. Are you telling me that even in this day in 1980, the federal government is responsible for delivery of all social services to Indian land? On the reserve. On the reserve. Okay. And you are responsible for carrying out the particular protection of children? That's correct. Uh, we're respon we have the Protection of Children Act is the responsibility of the provincial government. The federal government purchases the service from the Ministry of Human Resources uh, when it comes to child protection cases. So because of our expertise, our, our ministry's expertise in that area, they purchase the, the service. Can you now care for these children within your own housing and facilities? Yes, we can care for them. Like, we've got families that are taking a lot of children, for instance. Like, we've got one family that has seven foster children alone. And, uh, With the they, approval of Gracie's ministry, I presume? Well, some of them, some of them we do on our own. And uh, it's, really, uh, it's really evident that this is one of the problems we really do have is housing. But this year, we're putting into our community 13 units that we can uh, pick up some of the slack. Well, you would cooperate with that, wouldn't you, obviously? We have said right along that we would like to cooperate and we would like to have that. What evolved out of that was uh, what's called now the uh, Spalmish Indian Child, Child Welfare Bylaw Number 3. It was a codification of our traditional law as how we looked after ourselves. And it's uh, quite simplistic, but it's really powerful. It's really about, uh, the intent is really about rebuilding the families. You know, that still is the intent. In that process, I think that uh, uh, began to realize we had to uh, assert our jurisdiction and uh, you know, take take care of our children. The impact of the bylaw has been amazing, you know, for our people. Um, you know, having our own child welfare program in our community, um, I think we forget what it was like, you know, to have ministry workers come in and scoop kids. I don't know how many I've had, but. I think I counted up to 40, 40 kids that George and I have taken in. So I've learned a lot from the kids that I've looked after. We can have control of our children. I mean, the chief and council are the legal guardians of the children. But, I mean, we can be part of the case meetings. We can be part of the decision making. You know, we can be part of the appeals, <clears throat> you know, and for the most part, children stay connected with the community. 35 years later, and I don't, and honestly, I think our people have taken for granted what has happened. They don't recognize that what we have, no other uh, community in Canada has. The ability to put in place laws for our, for our people. And we've been doing that consistently. We've protected children and 
And I think that's what people miss. And we have to bring that up again and show, you know, show them this is the way it's got to be done for communities. Not only for our community, but all Sokopan communities, all First Nations communities across Canada. Because right now there's more children in care of the state. There's about 35,000 children in care of the state than there ever was when the residential school operated almost double the numbers. It's just amazing if you begin to look at it. In some parts of Canada, 70 to 80 percent of the children in care are Aboriginal or First Nations. In northern British Columbia here, 70 or 80 percent of the children in care are First Nations. So it's a real big issue and then people are, are not being able to deal with it because it's the provincial jurisdiction that they're applying to our children and families. It's not working. You know, I call it legislative genocide. They tore apart the core of our people, which is our governance, which is our family units. And they did that over a whole hundred and some odd years. And the 60 scoop was a reenactment of that. And I think enough is enough. We're saying, Canada, you have to stop declaring war on our children and our families. It's time for Canada to stand up and for the world to know that Canada has been doing this, not only to us, but all the indigenous people across Canada. And so enough is enough. There's a story in my heart, hear what I have to say A flood that came in the dark, but our people never changed We stayed together from the start, it only made us braver We see, you know, parenting issues with parents today you know, and if you trace their family roots, I mean, they had parents who were in residential school, parents who were in the 60s scoop, parents who were adopted out, you know, and there's a large demographic of our people who've never returned to the reserve. You know, many of the children blame themselves for what happened. They said, we should not have let this happen, but they forget they were children at that time. Myself included, I was 12 years old and I thought I should have stopped it. Yeah, what am I going to do? I'm a 12-year-old for Christ's sake, but I was the oldest male and that was my responsibility and I couldn't stop it. We had to change pathways to survive and our parents seen that, you know. Now we have to learn our ways in order to, to survive in here, you know. Yeah. We could survive and have, have uh, survival materially, material survival, but spiritual survival is what we're, we're grasping for now, you know? Yeah. It means helping each other and really that's what the, that was what the families used to do. We're trying to reinstate that kind of concept back in ourselves in terms of people. You know, Kanukun is really about to look after yourself. You know, teaching the young people how do they look after themselves. And so it's really about those kind of concepts that is Sokhapmtsin that we got to reintroduce into our families because that's what was taken away. And that's their identity as Sokhapmtsin people, their identity as a father, mother, brother, sister, all of those roles that we played, hunter, gatherer, you know, all of those things. And the kids are starting to get it. The kids are starting to get it. I'm very proud of Easton, watching him play hockey. I think he's a great role model for younger Native boys. Makes me feel good knowing that my parents are still there watching me. Easton was born in, on June 23rd, 1997, and I think he was yeah, a little over a year <laughs> old when he came into the centre. What's your best memory of coming to the Chimic Sultan? 
I'd probably have to say the after school care when we came up and learned the language with the kias. The cat said, who, me? The language is key because it, it ties us to the land, ties us to each other, and it uh, creates our identity because our identity comes from the land. I like them kids when they come in, you know, and they, they look with them blue eyes and hair, they're saying white gear, you know. <laughs> Even in town, they see me white gear. Their role would have been to teach us respect and how to gather berries, you know, how to make birch bark baskets. All of the things that the children are learning are the things that they probably would have traditionally learned before the scoop happened, you know, from a grandparent. We're a family with everything around us. It's all about reconnecting and that interconnectedness that is taught. You know, the concept of kosalten, when we say kohayat is kosalten, all our relations. We're related to everything, not just the two-legged, the four-legged, the winged ones, all of creation. That's our teaching and that's what we're trying to bring back with what we're doing because that's part of, that's one of our foundational laws and it is about family. They're getting early brain development, they're getting early childhood education, but they're also getting a strong foundation in the culture and the language and our traditions and protocols. And, you know, these kids are looking better. They're going through school and, you know, they're not ashamed to be Indian anymore. I held on to my culture, it's been calling me back. There is a story of hope. Winds of change. Well, I think Tuitimus is giving people in the community uh, an opportunity to share time together and share time together in a really positive sense. Knowing what this community has gone through in terms of the 60s scoop, it's, it's so important to tell those stories. My name is Kyle Harley. I was born on September 12, 1993, and I was adopted on September 26, 1993 to John and Sheila Hartley in Vancouver, B.C. When I was 13, my parents told me I was adopted. It was a total surprise. So I think there's a real building of an awareness, and you know, outside our community and also inside our community, but more so I think healing for our younger people that don't, didn't understand there's questions they're asking, why are they taking the kids away? Because our young people don't know about that. They never experienced it and probably never will, which is a great thing. And I think that's what it's all about, is just that education and that awareness of uh, our history. So. There is some concern about this child, Mrs. Billy. Children whose parents don't properly take care of them must be placed in a suitable home. I'm taking care of her. Child Protection Services is concerned that a grandmother cannot fill the role of both She's parents. She's my grandchild. And it's not really fair to you. I mean, given your age. You mustn't worry, Mrs. Billy. We will take very good care of her. We're very concerned about her welfare, as I'm sure you are. We aren't just the trauma of child welfare. We aren't just the trauma of residential school. We can, that's just such a small period of time. And yeah, we have to contend with that now, but we have this incredibly rich history and, and, and the stories and the teachings uh, to draw upon. Maybe it'll be a start for people to look at those things and to search out for themselves what they need to do. I think that our community needs healing, you know, and I think that that may happen through maybe a huge, like a four-day community healing ceremony, you know, where everybody from our community goes to the Salmon River Arbor and, and we listen to people talk, you know, we listen to people share their stories, you know, because I think that's the only way that people are going to get past all of the hate and the negativity and, and stuff, because we have to learn how to love each other again. And if we don't understand who somebody is, 
you know, and why are they negative? You know, it, it, we have no empathy for them. We have no caring for them. We have no ability to love them. But when you really know their story, you know, it opens your heart up, you know, and you know, that person is hurting. Telling their story is a way of letting it go and also letting other people know that may be with them that, hey, it's not just me. I'm not alone in this. Because that's the other part of it. People think they're alone. But it just happened to me. But no, it happened to all of us. You'll be my journey. Conversation, address what is real, connected to the land, we are one with each other. This is our home to discover. Yeah, 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 yeah. 